Okay, welcome to part eight of my series examining Russ Miller's 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the Textbooks. So I will get started. Now, once again, they're going to throw out a lot of misleading information to try to trip you up on the information issue. <laughs> wow, I cannot believe you just said that. Uh, evolutionists are going to throw out false misleading information. Um, the irony is pretty thick there, uh, Russ Bucket. Gene transfers are oftentimes claimed by evolutionists as one way to get new and beneficial genetic information created. Now, it's true that gene transfers can increase the amount of DNA in an organism. Now, these have absolutely nothing to do with creating new and beneficial genetic data as Darwinism requires. In gene transfers, bacteria transfer very small amounts of DNA called plasmid transfers to other bacteria. Now, this is information transfer. This is not information creation. The data already had to exist in order to be transferred. This has nothing to do with Darwinian change. Yes, gene transfer does occur. However, I'd love to see a source of where we evolutionists think that it, it accounts for all of our new and beneficial information added to the genome. I'd like to see where anybody's ever suggested that gene transfer is how nature accomplishes this. Darwinists focus the discussion on micro because there's no viable evidence of macro to show anybody. When, in fact, Charles Darwin never saw an example of Darwinian evolution. When he went to the Galapagos Islands, Darwin made a brilliant observation. He counted 13 varieties of finches on the Galapagos, from white to yellow to black, thick bill finches to thin bill finches. He made a great observation. What had he observed? He had observed micro adaptations, finches bringing forth finches caused by the sorting or the loss of the genetic information. Of course, we didn't know that at that time. And he jumped to the miraculously erroneous conclusion that somehow that proves that all plants and animals evolve from one another. He made a great observation and a terrible conclusion. Do you even bother checking your sources, checking your references at all? Um, are you just really cut and paste, copy, say, repeat any other, any creationist garbage you find. Um, I, really, answer me this, that question. Galapagos finches, huh? So Darwin noticed differences amongst the finches, which, by the way, he didn't. Um, that's, but that's an aside. Uh, later on, the finch story was incorporated into, into Origin of Species and, in, and into later editions of his Voyage of the Beagle. But he did not look at the finch beaks and then from there extrapolate that all life had a common ancestor based on those finches. That is a load of crap. In fact, that, that is so bad that I, I don't know. So I hate to take up time, but I, I think it's important that I tell what was actually important about the finches. And by the way, just a fun fact, they're not finches at all. Um, they were thought to be finches. Uh, then they were thought to be sparrows. Um, and now, based on genetics, our friend genetics, the friend of evolution, um, they're now actually a tanager uh, in the group with the tanagers, like the uh, western tanager and such. They're in, they're in that group of birds, not finches at all, but that's irrelevant. Uh, the point, the what's significant though about the finches, and this is this is what really really was important uh, for Darwin. Um, what once the, once the identifications, once he once he came back and his birds and the birds of others other people collected on the same voyage. Uh, were identified properly and shown to all be closely related. He thought that he, Darwin actually thought they were different um, mockingbirds and um, starlings and things. Like, I mean, he thought they were a wide variety of different types of bird, um, not recognizing that they were all really closely related. And um, but what was significant about it when he was putting the story together is that he noticed something really, really interesting. He noticed that the finches um, on the Galapagos were all related to. Um, mainland finches from South America. Finch, again, these were all, all of these are actually tanagers, um, but I'm using the word finch because that's, that's sort of the common name for them. And he noticed that they were all, all of them. In other words, um, believing, of course, at the time in special creation that God poofed all these things into their all, prospective places on the planet, um, it kind of was a, a interesting, the fact that the closest relative of this diverse group 
on the island of the, on the Galapagos Islands was the species that was also found the closest to the the archipelago on the mainland of South America. Um, and with that fact in mind, he started looking at other um, plants, mammals, and bird collections from other places all, along the voyage of the Beagle. And he found that the same rule holds. In other words, if you found a unique species or group of species on an island, without fail, their closest relatives were always going to be the species found on the mainland near, nearby. Okay, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, if you know they were created, they could have been created randomly. Um, there'd be no reason for this, this the fact that they would be related. Um, it did make sense in the sense that if you were to accept that the Galapagos finches evolved from one of the mainland birds, um, or several of the mainland birds, whatever, um, that then diversified once they got to the island. And so this is this was the critical important thing about Darwin's theory. Nowhere did he use the finches to extrapolate that all life had a common ancestor. Okay, um, that. I, again, read this fucking book, Russ, okay? Read it, and you tell me. I, I'd love to see where in this book he uses the finches to, to make the claim that all life um, originated from a common ancestor. Darwin's theory, and we're being lenient to call it a theory, Darwin's theory was refuted years ago. Today, the humanistic textbooks now teach neo-Darwinism. When exactly was Darwin's theory ever refuted? Huh? Explain. Uh, tell me. Tell me, Ross. When, when, when did this happen? Because I kind of missed it. Um, so did the rest of the scientific community. We we, we, we didn't get that, that memo that, that the Darwin's theory was refuted years ago. Oh, and by the way, how is it being lenient to call uh, the Darwin's theory a theory? How is it? How is that the case there, Russ? Uh, I'd like to hear this. Um, um, it's a perfectly good theory. In fact, it's one of, if not the strongest theory in science. And this is based on three false assumptions. One, that mutations create the new and beneficial uh, data, and that natural selection makes the mutant take over the gene pool, leading to evolutionary change with the magic ingredient, which is millions and billions of years of time. Neo-Darwinism. You know what Neo-Darwinism is? That, do, you, do, do you know what it is? Um, Neo-Darwinism is... Darwin's theory of natural selection with the added element of Mendelian genetics, okay? I.e., Darwin did not know of Mendelian genetics. He didn't know how inheritance worked. He believed that inheritance was a blending. Um, and which, it, 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 if you don't do really, really controlled experiments, it kind of looks like that. Um, Mendel, of course, with his raising his peas, um, was able to separate that out. A pretty amazing story, by the way, if you ever want to look up a really interesting history of science. It's a lot more fascinating than the introduction to biology version of the story. Um, but that that's all on the side. Um, the point is, is that Darwin believed in some kind of a blending of characteristics. Um, he didn't know about DNA, didn't know about these things. And, and so that was kind of a missing element in his theory of natural selection. Um, once Mendelian genetics were rediscovered and rediscovered by rediscovered I mean Mendel's work became uh, popularized and, and was well known um, in the 1930s or 1920s actually but really in the 1930s with uh, uh, Ronald Fisher's A Genetical Theory of Natural Selection that was called the Neo-Darwinian Synthesis the synthesis of that that's what Neo-Darwinism is your what is it you say uh, mutation and selection and what is it here millions of years uh Find me that. Find me. Find, I mean, that, that's in Darwin's original. That's in Origin of the Species. That's in what you would call Darwinism, not Neo-Darwinism. You're just again, you're trying to discredit these things. You're, you're trying to discredit uh, the work of really, really good people by outright lying about what they said. They're going to say somehow a bacteria overcame the law of biogenesis and all mathematical possibility and then mutated its way to everything on Earth, including you and I, which they consider us humans to be the ultimate mutation. And if you want to believe you're the ultimate mutation, I just say, God bless you, that's your choice. I believe I was made in the image of God, just like God's word says. Tell me, Russ, uh, you're created in the image of your God, uh, as you say, and if that's true, I'm curious as to what your creator would have to say about the fact that you're using the incredibly complex mind 
that he created for you. Uh, in order to mislead and deceive, uh, rather than actually spreading valid information, you're smearing the name of good, hard-working scientists, outright lying about what they say. You've already done it, and I'm going to show a couple more examples of that. Um, I mean, and I mean lie. I don't mean mistaken. I mean you lie about what they say. You take quotes that they never actually said from sources that don't exist um, and say, and look what this evolutionist says, um, in order to get your audience to cough up those donations you keep flashing up on the screen. Back to the Harvard professor and Nobel Prize winner. He says, time is in fact the hero of the plot. The impossible becomes possible given enough time. He says, time itself performs the miracles. They do indeed worship at the altar of millions of years of time. All right, just, no, I don't have an issue with that. I just wanted to congratulate you. You, you actually quoted a uh, walled quote intact. That's exactly what he said. It's completely out of context, and um, you're suggesting that he's intending something he didn't intend. But nonetheless, at least those are words he actually said, rather than the earlier quote you quoted from him, which was completely made up. This Nobel Prize winning mutation expert stated, good mutations are so rare, we consider them all bad. So tell me, Russ, did you look up that Mueller quote yourself? Did you get that article, um, uh, the, the article that he wrote about mutations and radioactivity and actually read that quote and, and, and transcribe it yourself for that slide? Or are you cutting and pasting from another creationist? Think, think, think about it before you answer there, douchebag. Because you know what? That's a fucking made-up quote. Okay? Mueller never said that, you dumbass. Okay? That's... It, in a lot of creationism, you search, type in those keywords, and you'll find 10,000 creationist websites that all quote that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you look up the source, you look up the actual paper that it's cited from, um, and usually they have a few sentences in front of that, and then they, they bold that to make it stand out. But And the few sentences in front of it are more or less intact from what Mueller said. They tacked on that sentence, okay? That sentence isn't in that article at all. It's fabricated. And if you actually looked up your information, if you actually fact-checked instead of just spewing whatever creatard garbage comes your way, um, you would know that. Um, but again, I know what? I have a sneaking suspicion you don't give a shit if it's accurate or not. Um, you, If you happen to catch this video and you see that, you're not going to scrub that slide from your presentation. No, you're going to give that presentation again, and you're going to use that same quote again. It certainly helps convince the uh, parishioners to cough up those donations, doesn't it, Russ? Here's a problem for neo-Darwinism, that mutations create the change. Mutations are also caused by the sorting or the loss of the parent starting genetic information, not by the addition of new and beneficial genetic data. Gene depletion applies to mutations just as well as to adaptations. In other words, after millions of observations, scientists can show you no examples of mutations creating new and beneficial genetic data. Gene depletion again, Russ. Um, again, you might want to look up these words before you throw them out. You're talking about allelic depletion, okay? We're talking about when an allele becomes fixed in a population. It's not gene depletion, dumb shit. Have you ever heard that AIDS will evolve and or the bird flu will evolve to where the uh, antibiotics we have today will not be effective on them? Actually, there's no evolution here whatsoever, which shows their desperation and the fact they throw it out there as an example. No, Russ. Nobody's ever said, at least nobody with any credibility, has ever said that AIDS evolves. Um, AIDS is a syndrome. AIDS is caused by a virus. The virus called human immunodeficiency virus. The virus evolves, um, not, not, the, not the syndrome that it causes. I realize that's... The small distinction, but again, we got to be careful with our words, right? Okay, I'm out of time. I'm going to take up this uh, discussion of viruses and evolution in part nine.